get, get started this morning, let's, uh, let's go ahead and open our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verse 17. If you're using the black chair Bibles in front of you, you'll find it on page 901, page 901, 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. We're going to begin a, begin a new uh, series for the next three weeks, not, not our normal series where we would go expositionally through a book. We're going to start that up in February when we dive into the book of Colossians and learn what it means to be complete in Christ. But this week and for the next two weeks after, for a, a three-week total, we're going to be looking at a more topical series, a short series that tackles the area of church membership posing and, and hopefully answering the question, what is church membership? And so while you're opening your Bibles there to 1 Corinthians, I want to just take a little bit of extra time in the introduction to talk a little bit about um, why we're coming to this study and also a little bit about what church membership is not, so I can get rid of some of those ideas before we start the next three weeks to identify what church membership really is. Um, this is, uh, this is not an original series. In fact, it's, we, we did this series almost exactly six years ago uh, when we first instituted church membership here at Christian Bible Church. And um, as elders, we were talking about where we are as a church, and we feel that it's time that we reconsider what membership is. And we also use these sermons for anyone who desires to become a member, that they have to listen to it so they understand what it is we're talking about. And uh, we wanted to have better updated recordings on them, too, so... There are also many of you, as we were talking about why should we redo it, there, there's a lot of folks that have come into the church now who aren't members. You've been here, some of you have been here for quite a while, you're involved, you're active, um, but you haven't fully committed, you haven't joined the church and become members, and so I, I think we should walk through this to, re, to remind us of the importance of church membership and make sure that we understand what it is we're talking about. There are, are many unbiblical views of uh, church polity and church membership that exist today. Um, it, they, they, church polity is how the church is governed. And, and ma- there are many unbiblical views that are brought into that. Some of them are unbiblical and they are contrary to biblical. They're actually wrong. They're, they're heresy, uh, meaning that they're not found in the scriptures and they're also contrary to what is found in the scriptures. Uh, for example, the Roman church practices the, the role of a priest and a, and a pope to step in. They, they use them as a mediator between the lay people of the earth and God himself. They also exalt the pope into a position of holiness. These are heretical teachings. They're not in the scriptures. There's no foundation for them. They deny the biblical teaching of the priesthood of the believers, and they add the pope and the priest as mediators between God and man when the scriptures are clear that there's only one mediator who is Christ Jesus. There are other teachings, though, that come along about church membership that are also unbiblical, but they're not contrary to scripture. Meaning, the Bible doesn't explicitly say this is how you should do it or this is how you shouldn't do it. It kind of leaves it open. And so as long as we're not contrary to scripture, it may be okay to apply some of those. Uh, there, these are things that are not spelled out in Scripture, so there is room for differences in how we practice them. Formal church membership is one of these teachings, one of these doctrines, one of these church polity things that comes in that's not entirely spelled out in Scripture. We don't have a full roadmap on it, so there is some, some room and flexibility in it. But the, the Scriptures don't tell us how to, how to keep a record of church members um, generally, there was only one church in a local town to begin with, so if you were a Christian, that was the church that you went to to become a part of. So much has changed in the last 2,000 years. Today, most American towns have multiple churches, uh, all claiming the banner of Christendom. And often, there are more than one uh, that contain the true church, more than one that are true and sound. So if you were to look across the Mohawk Valley, there's a plethora of churches here that would claim to be Christian. Many of them are not Christian at all, even though they would claim to be. They have no idea what the gospel is. But there are a number who do understand the gospel. They do hold true to the gospel. And they're all within a driving distance that we can get to. So it's more than just having one sound church in an area. 
Now, there are some doctrinal differences that may step up between some of these sound churches, but as long as they're holding true to the gospel, we can join with them as sister churches. We recognize them as the true church um, because they hold to the true gospel. And so you're left joining a church, one of these churches, far different than what it was when the first church was born. The church elders are commanded to watch out for the members of the church. The church is not meant to be a a weekly flow or a shift, so even though there are several sound churches in the area, uh, we are not intended to be bouncing from one to the other. I like what this series this church is doing, and next month I like the series that that church is doing, and this summer the ch- this church is going to have this program or this event, so I'll be there for a while and kind of bounce around. That was never the intention of it, and, and that makes it very difficult for the church leadership to know who it is that they're watching over. The local church needs clarity as to who is shouldering the ministry load with them, who it is that can be counted on. The elders need to know who it is that they have to give an account for. Because you have to understand, as elders of the church, one day we have to stand before God and give an account to how it is that we governed and led the church. How it is that we watched over the sheep that God entrusted to us as under-shepherds. Therefore, the leaders need to know who it is, who is it that we are going to have to give an account for. There's also a pressing need for us to talk about what it means to be committed to the church. We'll specifically talk about that in a later sermon here, but there is a a cultural shift that uh, uh, some might call generational, um, though I think it probably starts with one generation, and I think it rapidly spreads across all the generational lines. And that shift comes in the form of a weakened understanding of what it is to be committed or what commitment is in general. It it is a... The the church in America is facing an epidemic of, uh, of, of... Commitment, and not not a lack of commitment, but a warped and skewed understanding of what commitment is. The first first world culture uh, understood what what commitment was and what the obligation was, and when they joined the church, they understood what it was that they were committing to. But today we see commitment with a much lighter obligation. Obligation. And I do recognize that it's not just a church issue, it's a generational issue. It's more than just a Christian issue. It rears its head across all sectors of community volunteerism. In other words, in our day and age, it's very hard to get people to to commit to volunteer for something. I was uh, recently talking with a volunteer fireman. It was actually while I sat in the back of the ambulance on my ride to the hospital. And... uh, (laughs) As I was chatting with them, we were talking about the lack of volunteers. And I was so thankful for their willingness to be there and to care for me. But he was, he was sharing that it's harder and harder to get people to commit to serve in the volunteer fire. He said when he starts to talk to a group, he'll often try to recruit some young people, whether they're college kids or whether they're high school kids, but get them as young adults and come in. And he says as he recruits them, he says that one of the pressing questions that always comes to the top is, how much do we get paid for volunteering? (laughs) Clearly, we don't understand what it means to volunteer, let alone what it means to commit as a volunteer. The other problem is for them, of course, that, and, and perhaps the even greater problem is once they do commit, it is, are they really committed? What does it take to be considered committed and part of it? Do I just come when I feel like it? Like when it shows up in, in my schedule and I, and I have room for it? You know, so the fire bell goes off, but I'm in the middle of a good show. I don't know if I really want to go out. I'm kind of comfortable here. I just won't go. But I'll go if I'm feeling good and if the time of day is right and I'm not doing anything else, then I'll go and answer the fire call. Is that okay? Is that commitment? Many people are interested in helping out, but they're not interested in committing to that role. The problem is community-wide, but it is, it is more piercing when it's brought into the church. There are more and more Christians who are seeking to fit the church gathering around their lifestyle instead of molding their lifestyle around the church gathering. In other words, church becomes a spoke that fits in the wheel of their desires in life, their mostly secular life, and I have this branch of church 
instead of understanding that the church gathering, that this is the hub of life and everything else spins out from it. This is the priority in life. If asked many who attend a particular church one to two Sundays a month, they would consider themselves to be committed, wholly committed. Do you realize that's only 12 to 18 services a month? Maximum of 24, I mean a year, maximum of 24. That, that doesn't really sound to me like being wholly committed. According to one study, a typical Southern Baptist church has 233 members. Yet the typical Sunday attendance at the same church is 70. 70. That's at least 163 members that aren't attending. And by the way, most churches' membership starts at 18, so that would mean children also. And of course, there are those who would come who aren't members. So in reality, it's probably closer to 200 members who don't come every week. I'm certain some of them are away on vacation. Some are dealing with sickness. Some are dealing with or working, or some of them are shut-ins themselves. I understand that there are reasons that we can't be there every week. Obviously, I haven't been here this year. There are reasons, Right? I get that. But it's when it becomes the norm. Because, see, I think for the majority of them, it's not the rare exceptions. The normal practice is, if I don't have anything else going on, then I'll be part of the church. Then I'll come. I spoke to a local pastor about the same topic some time back, and, and he noted some research of his own. He said in his church there were just over 200 people who would consider the church their home church. They would consider themselves committed to that church, and yet their Sunday service was just under 100 every week. That means about 50% of those who claim that this is, they are committed to the church are not there. I get it if it's maybe 25%. There's a rotating aspect. He said, by the way, it's not the same. It's not the same people. It's a rotation of people. Some come for a week, and then they're gone for two weeks, and then back for a week, and on the weeks they're gone, somebody else is on that schedule of coming. I get it. I see that. We're not any different here at Christian Bible Church. We probably have 95 to 100 in our uh, that would consider this to be their church fellowship, and, and we rotate through. We're probably better than the 50% aspect, um, but I do grow concerned at times for some of us. What is our major focus and commitment? What really concerns me is not the numbers that attend church, but it's the misunderstanding of what it means to be committed to the church, what it means to be a member of the church. And it's why, uh, why it is so important that you are here as your regular practice. There are skewed priorities in our lives today as we, look, as we live in this world. And as Christians, our top priority must be Christ. It must be the gathering together with His body, with His bride, for the worship of the King. That must be priority. As I said, it has to be the hub of our life, the church. doesn't mean that you can't be away on a given Sunday for some particular reason, but it means that your normal practice is to be here and to gather with the body as part of the church. So we're going to take the next few weeks. We're going to talk about church membership. We're going to talk about the covenant, which is the relationship of church members this morning. Then we'll talk about the calling, which is the role of church memberships. And then finally, the commitment, which is the responsibility of church members. But before I jump in to talk about what church membership is, I do need to take this moment, as I mentioned at the beginning, to talk about what it's not so I can get rid of some of those. So this introduction is going to be lengthy before we get to reading our text. I want to eliminate at the outset some of the false understandings. First, church membership is not a movement. It's not a movement. The local church is not a movement that you enjoy. Now, culturally, there's a lot of movements. We easily get stirred up with political movements, um, with uh, social movements and endeavors, and we get the rallying cry, and we want to join the group. Each age, each generation has political and social hot buttons and movements that stir us up. 
So we answer the rally cry and we, we join the movement. We want to make our voice heard. And the more people that respond, the louder the voice. And then maybe we can affect change. And so we try to rally around and get as many people to join and we stir them up. Motivate them. Well, the church is not a movement which you are needed to join. Like, we need you, we need to rally, we need to, to stir everybody up just to rah-rah, to, 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 to cheer, to make our voice heard. The call to join the church is not a call for more bodies or more voices to advance a movement. And we have been given the instruction of God, of Christ Jesus, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, to make disciples of, of every nation, of every people group to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is our commission. It's what we have been instructed to do. But understand this. The gospel moves at the pace and the power of the Holy Spirit of God and not according to the power of the people. So the church is not a, a movement which we want to stir everybody up for this one rallying cry as though the gospel will not go forward if we don't. The gospel moves at the power of of the Holy Spirit of God. Secondly, the church is not a team. Now, there are team aspects to church membership, but it is not a team, like as in a team competition. I think many look at church membership as a competition, and we want to join our favorite church and as, as we act through competing against other churches. My church is better than your church. <clears throat> we serve Starbucks at our church. We send a thousand shoe boxes each year. Our youth group is larger. We have more effect. We have a prettier building. We have cooler music. Somehow we view it as a, as a team that we need to be a part of. I think maybe a, a, a more clear picture of this and, and really a worse picture is that of, of the NFL mentality. We, we tend to join a church like we are fans joining an NFL team. You know what a fan does when they join an NFL team, right? <clears throat> they go down, they buy the jersey, they follow key players, they, they use personal pronouns about their team, right? Their team. They say we and they say us when they cheer. I've paid particular attention to this and the way that people talk about their team over the last several years. I've tried to observe it. And I've tried to restrict how I speak about it, to be very careful of my own tongue. But fans will often shift the way they talk about their team. They act as though they're actually part of the team. In fact, some of them, I think, really believe they are part of the team. There'll be games on this afternoon. Turn it on and watch when they pan the crowd. And look at the way some of them are dressed. Some of the crazy attires. They call them fans. You know what fan is short for, right? Fanatic. <laughs> Fanatic. Often fans of an NFL team will speak that way. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> fans will, uh, will speak about a team as though they are part of it. They use those personal pronouns and they'll say, we need a new quarterback next year. We need to do this. We need to do that. Or they'll talk about their team against your team. You know, we are the best team in all of history. In fact, just this winter, I was talking with a Patriots fan. And he said to me as, as we were talking about teams and stuff, and of course I'm not a fan of the Patriots, but he obviously is. And I said something about them not being all that great this year. And he said, well, we just let our rings do our talking. I thought, oh, so my response was, you do? Can I see your ring? <laughs> Which ring do you have? <laughs> of course, he doesn't have any rings because he's not actually on the team. See, while fans can enjoy the game, at the end of the day, they're not actually part of the outcome. They don't score touchdowns. They don't sack quarterbacks. They don't get the prize. They're just fanatic observers. Now, you may argue that the bolsterous cheering, the loud encouragement helps the team and therefore you can claim part of the victory. But I have yet to meet a fan who has claimed part of a defeat. 
taking responsibility for a loss. I've also observed that fans only show up on Sunday. They're not at the training facility throughout the week. They're not studying film. They're not practicing. They're not preparing in any way for the following week's game. Many Christians view church membership like this. They join the church to follow the pastor, to follow other leaders, to follow the program, to follow whatever's going on. They use terms like we and us, but they have no involvement in the church. They're not advancing the gospel. They're not shouldering the ministry load. They cheer loud on Sundays when they come. They, are, they demand to be entertained. They demand an engaging event when they're there, but they're not involved the rest of the week. Third, church membership is not a gym. It's not a gym. This is maybe the, the most common misunderstanding about church membership because it's the way we view membership of clubs. <clears throat> We view church membership as a commodity that we buy. So we shop around like we would for a gym. Which one's going to give me the best bang for my buck? What are they going to do for me? What are they going to offer me? I just checked this week. And right now, until Wednesday, the 31st of the month, you can still go down to Planet Fitness and sign up for a dollar. And then $10 a month, and you can be part of the gym. You know what you get? You get unlimited 24-hour access to the gym. You get to use all of their equipments. They've got big screen TVs, and most of the equipment still works with the headphones, so you can actually listen to it while you work out. They've got free weights, locker rooms to change in. If you pay a little extra, <clears throat> they've got tanning booths in there that you can use and massage chairs. There's uh, <clears throat> free fitness training if you need a coach, free Wi-Fi. They even give you a free T-shirt and sometimes a bag when you sign up. They used to do free pizza night and free bagel Tuesday. I'm not sure they're offering that anymore. But, you know, you do get the little purple Tootsie Rolls when you sign up still. That's a lot for 10 bucks a month and only a dollar. But that's not what church membership is. Yet I think we look at it that way. We view it as a commodity to be consumed. That's because we are a narcissistic culture and we're driven by self-gratification. So when we come to church... We want to know, what are we going to get out of it? And unfortunately, we also tend to market joining the church in the same fashion. I read an article on, online some years back called Six Wonderful Benefits of Church Membership. The engaging article noted that many in their 20s and 30s are resistant to joining the church so to com combat their resistance, the author listed out six benefits of joining the church. You may be resistant to it, but let me tell you the benefits you're going to get when you join. Friendship, opportunities to make a difference, accountability, a sense of community, personal development, and social events. You get all of that if you join our church. The fundamental flaw there is not in the particular benefits that are listed. Indeed, I think they're factual. But it's in the listing of benefits at all. That's where the problem lies. Many years ago, <clears throat> when I was living in Africa, I was uh, charged by the elders of the church to approach a young man who had been in our church for a while. He had been involved in our church, but he had never joined the church. And they said, you need to go and talk to him and encourage him to become a member of the church. And so one Sunday afternoon I did, I met with him and I said, hey, you, uh, you should really join the church and become a member. And he said, oh, wh why is that? And so I proceeded to list off benefits of joining the church. Not too different than what that list was, although I was certain to include church discipline because I truly believe it is a benefit of joining the church. You will be held accountable and the church will love you enough to go after you if you fall into sin. And I listed all of this off and said, this is why you should join. And he stopped me in my tracks and said, don't I get that already? <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, actually you do. You do get all of that already. And then I said, but you, you should still join. 
And I went away and sat back and said, huh, that doesn't seem to be the right approach or even what church membership is. It's a, a skewed understanding because it comes from a consumer perspective. What am I going to get? If you view church membership as a commodity to be consumed, then you will never be satisfied because your, your focus will only be on the benefits that you can consume and you're going to miss out on the real purpose and reason for joining the church. You're going to miss out on the glory of God. The glory of the God who takes sinners from every tribe and every tongue and every people group from every, every socioeconomical background, from diverse cultures, from di different intellects and different giftings, and he brings them together and makes them one unified people who will sing one song of worship to the glory of the Most High God. This is church membership. We'll unpack that as we continue. Enough about what it is not. Let's really begin to look at what it is by exploring our text, and I know it's we're well into our sermon time, but I'm still going to invite you to stand, if you're able to, for the reading of the Word of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 through 26. But in the following instruction, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the betterment, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not for the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you have proclaimed the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we pray that you would bless your word this morning. Help us to understand what a covenant people is and grasp what the covenant is that you have created with us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> As I said, we're going to spend the next couple of weeks answering this question of what is church membership. And I think it's best for us to start with this area of the covenant, which is what describes the relationship of church members. Christians are a covenant people, a new covenant people. Now, what is a covenant? In short, a covenant is an oath or bond or commitment between two or more parties. It's a promise, if you will. The covenant that binds us together is the covenant of God's grace. God's commitment to pour His grace out on His people and to save them from their sins. What I want to show you this morning is that the local church membership is the expression of that covenant. The covenant of grace is between the believer and it is between God and it is done through the work of Christ. The way that is revealed and exposed and is shown is by the covenant between the two believers. Because in the covenant relationship between the body of Christ, then we can demonstrate the covenant relationship that we have with the Father through the Son. In other words, it is a reflection of the genuine article. Much the way water baptism is a reflection of genuine baptism, Genuine baptism is when you die with Christ and are buried with Him and raised in the newness of life. That's the whole process of salvation. It's a spiritual thing. Water baptism is a public testimony to say, this is what happened to me. I am dead in Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but now He lives within me. And I am born again to a new life. Water baptism is the outward expression of true baptism. 
church membership, the covenant relationship with the believers is the reflection and the expression of the true covenant relationship between the God and the believer. The local expression of the new covenant. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time unpacking this passage, so you can just rest at ease. We're not going to be here all day. I just am really going to use it to to highlight two points that that pop up here with regards to the covenant. I want to look at two main thoughts from it, what the genuine covenant is and the reflective covenant. One of them binds us together in Christ and the other one reveals it. So first, this genuine covenant. Paul is writing this letter to the church at Corinth to correct the number of issues that were arising within the church. And one particular issue was the way that they were handling the Lord's table what we would call the communion table. What was meant to be a time of reflection and celebration, the celebration of what binds us together, which is unity in Christ, had become this source of division and pride. So Paul is reiterating to them what the table means and what it represents. And he does so by quoting the Lord Jesus from the night in which he was betrayed, the night in which he instituted the table, revealing the genuine meaning of the Passover. That is for another sermon. But look at verse 25, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-five. 25. It says, In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The old covenant, because now Jesus is referencing the new covenant. The old covenant was a conditional covenant between God and man, and it was written on tablets of stone. When Moses ascended the mountain, and God gave him the two tablets of stone, which had the law of God written with his own finger, we call them the Ten Commandments. He brought them back down to the people. This was representative of the covenant between God, the covenant of the law between God and man. The old covenant. And the way it works is, if you keep these commandments, then you will be my people and I will be your God. All you have to do is obey these commands entirely and you will be my people and I will be your God. The problem is, we can't keep the commandments. We can't keep them. If you read through the Ten Commandments, I'm confident you will come across one that you have literally broken, physically broken, though you may move several of them aside and say, well, I've never actually done that. I mean, I've never murdered anybody. Push that one to the side. But understand that it's deeper than just the external commitment of those, or breaking of those laws. It's also internal. It's spiritual. You you cannot obey them from your heart. Jesus brought these two together in his Sermon on the Mount. And he, he compared murder to anger and adultery to lust, noting that merely refraining from the outward action did not absolve you from the sin of the heart. Just withholding from actually bludgeoning someone to death does not mean you're not guilty of murder. He linked it to anger and hatred within the heart. If you hate somebody within your heart, you have sinned against them in the manner like murder. It's more than just the external practice. It's actually what goes on in your heart. He revealed in this process, he reveals the impossibility of sinful man to keep the old covenant. The purpose of the law is really to direct us to our need for a new covenant. It's to show us that we can't do it. We can't do it. The new covenant is a covenant in which God does all the work for us. It is a covenant that was prophesied in Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, in the days coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. It's a work of God. 
The new covenant is an unbreakable covenant because it is a covenant made by God and fulfilled by God. It's God, God's promise to forgive His people of their sins and to write His law on their hearts. Listen to how God's covenant work is described in the book of Ezekiel. It says, the Lord says, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove your heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. This flows right hand in hand. I'm going to take that heart of stone away from you, the dead heart. I'm going to give you a living heart that has written on it my law. I'm going to cause you to obey. I'm going to enable you to fulfill it because you can't on your own. This is the new covenant that we celebrate. God removing this heart of stone, the covenant of stone is being taken or being fulfilled. He replaces our heart with a heart of flesh with His law that is written on it. And He then gives us His Spirit to dwell within us and to cause us to walk according to the will of God. To walk as obedient children. This is the new covenant delivered through the blood of Christ who fulfilled the old covenant on our behalf. Jesus is the only man to fully obey the law of God. He was born without sin. He was tempted in every way. And yet he did not sin. He actually obeyed the law of God in every way. And then he who knew no sin became sin for us. He who had not sinned took on our sin so that we could take on His righteousness so that we who knew no righteousness, we could do nothing right, can take on His righteousness. And we can be declared as righteous, as fulfillers of the law. This is the genuine covenant. It's the gift of salvation. It's what makes us different from the world. It's what makes us a peculiar people, or what we call elect exiles. Elect because we are chosen by God. Exiles because we live in a world that is not our home. God is the one who does the work in our hearts. He changes it. You can't, you can't resist it. You can't fight it. You can't manufacture it. God blows like a wind. He gives you eyes to see. He gives you ears to hear. He loosens your tongue. He replaces your heart. And then as we live here in this world, we're exiles because this is no longer our home. We're different. We're changed. The Greek word that is translated throughout Scripture as church is ekklesia. And it means simply called out ones. Those who have been called out of the world. Called out from death and sin. And to be called out from something means logically you are called out from that and into something else. We are called out from the world and into a covenant relationship with God. A committed relationship with Him. One that is demonstrated by our obedience to His commands. For not only do we desire to obey Him, but we now have the ability to obey Him. We have the power of God, God the Holy Spirit, dwelling within us, changing us. Those found in the new covenant of Christ are the church universal. In other words, if you are really born of God, you are in the new covenant of His blood, then you are part of the church universal. The church universal surpasses time and distance it's global, it's historical, it's every believer from all time. This is the real church. It's the fullness of the genuine believers. It's the genuine covenant. Now, the second main point here from this text is the reflective covenant. This is how that genuine covenant is shown or revealed. I contend that this is the local gathering of the called out ones the local church. And I believe that it is paramount and is directly relinked to the genuine covenant. If you are truly born of God, truly part of His genuine covenant, then you will reflect that 
through a covenant with the local church. The Lord's table is a time to reflect on the salvation of man by God through Christ Jesus, to reflect on the great love of God demonstrated through the sacrifice of Christ, the only Son of God. And that table is only to be celebrated when the covenant people come together. You don't get to consume the Lord's table on your own, just when you want to. The consuming of the Lord's table is meant to be done as the church, as the the believers, the covenant members come together. Look at verse 18 in your text this morning. 1 Corinthians 11, 18, it says, For in the first place, when you come together as a church, ecclesia, called out ones, when you come together as called out ones from the world, the implication here and throughout the New Testament is that there is a local church, a local coming together, a local gathering of Christians. And it is vital to be part of one because you cannot celebrate the Lord's table without being part of the local church. Fellowship. This is what the writer to the Hebrew is talking about when he writes Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. He says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The writer of the Hebrews is saying, listen, you gotta, you got to come together. Don't neglect that commitment to one another. Don't neglect that covenant together. It's important for us to meet together. Why? So that we can stir one another up to good works. So that we can celebrate and remember the salvation that we have received through Christ. So that we can reflect the covenant of God. We are bound by God We are bound to God by the covenant of grace that is fulfilled and provided by Christ. This also binds us to each other so that we can reflect that covenant. The purpose of Christian Bible Church is to reflect this new covenant of God. In fact, it's, it's, our, our, our purpose is to imitate Christ. It's to glorify God in everything and to imitate Christ through the imitation of Him. How do we show the grace and the mercy and the glory of God? It's to imitate Christ. It is to demonstrate the love of Christ. While that can be demonstrated in part as individual Christians, it is reflected in full by the gathering of the Christians from every tribe, every tongue, and every people group. A new gathering that takes people who were not a people and makes them a people. Establishing a covenant between them. This gathering at Christian Bible Church is not a social gathering of people who have similar interests or similar socioeconomical backgrounds. We don't come together because we all have the same background. Same family, same history, same jobs, same likes, same interests. That's not why we're here. It wouldn't be enough to hold us together. No, this is a gathering of peculiar people. People who love one another with a God-designed and God-given love. Why? Because we're coming together to glorify God through the imitation of Christ. And we imitate Him by loving the way He loved. Jesus said in the Gospel of John in John 13, 35, By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And again, he said in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. The covenant relationship is one of laying down your life for your friends the way Jesus laid his life down for his friends. He laid his life down in love as a co- to create a covenant, a new covenant with you. You come together as part of the body of Christ to lay your life down for one another to reflect that covenant you have in Christ Jesus. Understand this, Whitney Houston had it all wrong. (laughs) She said the greatest love of all is learning to love yourself. Friends, that that is the antithesis of what great love is. Learning to love the church members with a sacrificial love. Learning to love others 
by laying your life down. This, this, Jesus says, is the greatest love. The church is not a club to come to. It's, it's a covenant relationship between new covenant followers of Christ. It is a gathering where we stir one another up to good works. It is a covenant commitment to walk through life in the exile together. It is a covenant commitment in the local church. This, this covenant commitment to the local church is a reflection of the covenant commitment that you have in Christ. As the weeks come here, we're going to talk about the role of church members and the responsibility of church members. But again, this morning, I just wanted to establish the basis of church membership as the relationship that we have with one another through Christ. The way your covenant relationship is with Christ is it, it is demonstrated through your covenant relationship with other Christians. Your commitment to one another your promise to gather, to stir to godliness those who are in the local church, this, it is all made evident by your love for one another. Friends, we are a covenant people. We don't come together to motivate one another. We don't come together to spectate. We don't come together to consume. We come together to imitate Christ, to love one another and to reflect the covenant that we have with God. We're coming together to reflect the glory of God. To stir one another to good works. To remember together the new covenant of Christ that binds us together and makes us one people and one family and one body. And if you are in Christ Jesus, then you need to be part of a covenant people. You need to be members of the local church. Wholly committed to it. Coveting together to walk in a manner that is worthy of the name of Christ. Because like baptism, this also is a reflection of your salvation. Let's pray together here. Father, we come this morning and are so grateful for the new covenant that we have in Christ Jesus. Help us, Father, to be faithful to demonstrate that covenant of love that we receive from you through Christ a covenanting together with other believers and reflecting that love by loving each other. I pray, Father, for your spirit to do your gospel work as well, for those here who may be hearing even the gospel call and what this new covenant is for the first time, then I pray, Father, that your spirit would do the work we just read in your text, that you would take hearts of stone and remove them and give them hearts of flesh, that you would cause the blind to see and the deaf to hear, Lord, you would loosen tongues that they might taste and see that you are God, that you are good. We praise you, we exalt you, we magnify you, and we thank you for the gift of salvation that comes through Christ Jesus. In his name we pray.